Well, hello and welcome everyone. It's just about a minute to the top of the hour here, but we are very excited to have all of you with us today. This is gonna be an exciting conversation with our very special guest speaker here, Steve Lockshin, to discuss estate planning and potential tax law changes. My name is Daniel Gregoire. I'm the training lead at Wright Capital. And today, as I said, we're very excited to have Steve with us. He is the founder and principal of Advice Period, former chairman of Converge uh, Convergent Wealth Advisors, formerly Lydian Wealth Management, and of course the co-founder of Vanilla Estate Planning Platform. He's a frequent speaker on estate planning and the contemporary approach to wealth advisory. So Steve, thank you so much for being with us. It's truly a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. Of course. And uh, so today we're, we're excited to have a conversation that's very timely and relevant. This has been kind of a wild year for everyone with uh, the campaign trail for Biden, you know, making uh, his way through the first hundred plus days. It's been a wild ride. So we're here to really talk about some of the changes that advisors potentially can expect in the future and to really discuss how you can leverage those changes within your firm to create more value for your clients and, and ultimately have a better understanding of, of what good next steps would be over now, we're here to, to navigate this conversation together. There is going to be a control panel for GoToWebinar that has some, uh, some questions, uh, a questions drop down menu. We're going to primarily keep it uh, between me and Steve today, but if there are any specific questions, you can feel free to enter those there and we can follow up after the webinar with some additional context. So, like I said, you know, Steve, thank you so much. If you're comfortable, we can certainly dive into the questions and get this started. I'm comfortable. I'm wearing shorts and slippers. Still at home. Living the dream. <laughs> Living the dream. Yeah, I know it's hot weather in the Northeast for, for a lot of individuals. Uh, but so when we're talking about estate planning today, I want to just lay some found, uh, foundational information for everyone and make sure everyone's, you know, has a good idea of, of really what, what we're talking about and ultimately who can benefit most from this. So just with, you know, a few words, you know, can you just tell us a little bit more about what clients specifically can benefit most from having an estate plan ultimately? I mean, this is going to sound like a, a silly answer, but e everyone. So if you have a family or if you have any money, you need an estate plan. Um, and so what is an estate plan? Well, if you have an estate that's below the exemption limit, it's your basic documents. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about what those include. But that ensures that you stay out of probate and that your money goes where you need it to go, that your children are cared for appropriately and you know, things that you want to happen, happen. Most people refer to that as their will, but it typically happens in the revocable trust um, or at least the majority of it. So for the anyone who is a client of an advisor obviously has some money or the prospect of making money and, and probably has a family. Um, so they should all qualify and they should all have up to date documents and again when we talk a little further we'll talk about what advisors know and don't know and we've been learning a lot through the vanilla platform as we work with lots and lots of different advisors um if you have a taxable estate which right now is over 23.4 million dollars those clients need a different kind of plan and more importantly starting no later than 2026 the exemption limit is going to come back down to about 6 million per person so a couple of 12 million um, is going to need a irrevocable plan to get assets out of their estate. And in that case, the tax is 40% on assets that are above the exemption limit. And so we'll talk more about why that's important. Great, great. And you know, for some of the advisors who who maybe are are just maybe uh, getting started with estate planning or, or maybe are a little less familiar with it, what in your mind would be, let's say, a good starting place for for those individuals to start really providing additional value for their clients? It's really as simple as asking, do you have an estate plan and can you get me the documents? The, the, the checklist, there are tons of checklists. We've put them out. If you just Google basic estate plan checklist, you'll find a bunch of things in right capital. There's a checklist of documents that you need. Um, making sure their client has them is probably the most important thing an advisor can do. It takes no skill. It's just asking the question and getting the documents. If you want to take it to the next level, maybe it's understanding some of the core documents or i'll tell you something that in the pandemic we've seen a ton of people have been moving so someone may have in fact i talked to someone the other day smart actually an attorney um, who had moved from new york to pennsylvania and i said have you updated your documents since you moved no i had well 
they need to. Or if you move from a, well, any state really, but if you move from a community property state to a non-community property or vice versa, those are all changes that, that an advisor can quickly identify as a need to update their plan. And then when you get to the next level, you start learning some more things about opportunities that should be handled through updates and estate plans. Fantastic. And certainly, you know, I think it's important, obviously things are changing this year uh, in terms of just what everyone is, is, is doing, where they're living, ultimately where they expect to, to be working in the future. Maybe it's not out of the office anymore. So that definitely poses a big opportunity to, to get out there and, and provide some additional context for those clients who may have not thought about that otherwise. Yeah. So as we look to the future here, as we kind of take a, a step back and, and understand, you know, with the Biden administration in place, with a potential, uh, you know, slight Democratic majority here, uh, you know, uh, what specifically are the things that advisors right now should be looking out for in terms of major changes that maybe their clients would, would really benefit from knowing more about? Well, it, it, let's start all the way at the far end of the spectrum, the very draconian proposals that have been put. I mean, even the 5% plan, um, you know, this is doing away with things that benefit the ultra affluent estate planning, uh, grant or trust benefits, discounts. Um, you know, grants have been a topic of discussion for a long time, even though they're effectively part of the code. Um, control. Uh, there have been a lot of court cases around how people control assets once they've transferred them. And so that's been a hot topic. And so we're seeing a, a very strong push by, call it the, the very left, <clears throat> to soak the rich. And that means estate taxes because that's the easiest way. Losing step up and basis has been a, a topic. Um, and, and I should say also, obviously, on the income tax side, there's corporate tax rates going up, potentially income tax rates going up. So Biden put out his green book. Um, there is a lot in there. What I think practically is going to happen is something that's way closer to the middle and probably closer to what we have today. It's going to be very, very difficult with a slight majority to get a lot of these things through. We're going to have midterms coming up where people are not going to want to lose their seats and see a massive change from you know Republican controlled to Democrat controlled. Um, so I don't think there's as much trouble on the horizon as, as people are worried about, but I still think advisors should talk to clients about what could happen under the most draconian circumstances. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, probably Biden put it best when he says, you know, change is certain, but compromise is inevitable, right? So I think, you know, ultimately uh, you shoot for the moon, but we'll, we'll see what happens uh, as things kind of pan out. And, you know, as we're all watching the headlines and, and keeping track of, you know, obviously the green book that, that came out and trying to get an idea of, of timelines and, and tempo for all this, you know, in your mind, are there specific Things that, that you would advise people, you know, look out for or, or moments where, you know, maybe things become, maybe start to becoming more real. Uh, is, is there anything that you would specifically recommend keeping your eye out for? I, I mean, today, again, let's break it to um, taxable versus non-taxable states. So over the exemption limit, we are definitely worried that the exemption limit will go down earlier than the sunset. Um, of, of the end of 2025. So we're encouraging clients that are above the exemption le limit to start using their exemption. And if they're well above it, to use all of it uh, today and certainly to retain the optionality uh, to use all of it. So that's an action that we're taking today. Things that we haven't been uh, jumping on, which I've seen some advisors jump on and I think maybe a little premature, realizing gains uh, because you're worried about cap gains rates going up. Uh, to me, I think that is an unnecessary triggering of taxes um, and can hurt a portfolio. Um, in the estate planning area, we really only have to worry about, do we use our exemption or do we not? Because if they do away with a step up in basis, they're gonna do away with a step up in basis and there's nothing you can do about it unless you plan to die early uh, to take advantage of it. And I've yet to see anybody opt for that. Um, Grantor trust rules, I think really hard to make go away. It's They're woven into the tax code in so many different places. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. So from an estate planning standpoint, other than the basics that you should be doing every single day, every year for your advisor, I mean, excuse me, for your client, 
knowing what they have, making sure it's up to date, making sure it's in the right state, making sure they're high quality documents, things of that nature. If there are changes, deaths, births, marriage, divorce, uh, all those things should uh, trigger a review of the estate plan. The only thing I think in light of potential changes is use of your exemption uh, this year as opposed to waiting. Um, and the only other thing I think I would be aware of is Congress can go back to, I mean, it's not unconstitutional to go back to the beginning of the year. It is unlikely. But what is possible is if they say, just like Biden's plan did, hey, this is going to go back to April or to whatever date they propose something, that can happen. And I wouldn't want to be caught with my pants down as an advisor, having not spoken to a client about the remote possibility, if it's remote or any possibility that something changes and they weren't aware of it. Fantastic. And, and to that point of, you know, maybe getting ahead of the things that are important, I think, you know, also want to just maybe address in your mind, obviously, we, we talked about the exemption uh, limits there, but what clients are, are you think most vulnerable to, to some of these changes as we look into the future? And, and maybe who should we be, you know, working with to, to make sure that they have at least an idea of what, what could change? Again, I think it's going to hit the folks above the limit. And I said 23.4, that's for a married couple. So it's $11.7 million per individual. It's indexed. It goes up a little bit each year, unless there is a, a change where it comes back down. And again, in the end of 2025, it'll come down to 5 million index. So it should be roughly 6 million uh, back to 2010 is the index. Um, I don't, however, want to skip over the importance of everybody else having a plan. And most advisors don't have the majority of their clients over the exemption limit. And so I think it's worth spending time on everybody who is not going to be affected by any real changes. Um, again, again, unless there's uh, income tax changes, which we can't really plan ahead of other than possibly taking gains, which I've already said I don't, I don't uh, recommend. Um, what we tend to see is advisors don't understand whether or not clients have good plans and they don't get paid to review their plans. They get paid on assets under management in general. And so if you get paid under assets under management, what do you focus on? How do I get more assets under management? Well, not having a good plan can be perilous for a family, particularly if they've got children. And as I always joke with folks like, hey, don't worry about it. If you don't have a plan, the state does, and I'm sure your kids will be fine. They may have to take a little few weeks at the at um, daycare at somebody else's house, uh, but you should have a plan for your kids. Then certain states probate is way worse than it is in others, and it's expensive and it's public. It's unnecessary. Having quality documents is is important. And and I learned kind of firsthand. You know, we're a planning first RIA. When I asked some of our better advisors. Do you know if your clients have all of their documents in place? Said, yep, they got them. I have them all in box. You can go check them. And so sure enough, I went and checked them. Trust but verify. Um, and they did. But my next question was, do you know if they're any good or not? And the answer is, nope, I, I have no clue. I don't, I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand these documents. And this is where I think a lot of advisors get hung up, is they don't understand this stuff, so they avoid it because they don't understand it. We have a bunch of attorneys, or I should say former attorneys, former practicing attorneys, state attorneys on staff. So I had them reviewed and turned out four of the five that we randomly pulled needed new documents. They had bad terms in there. They'd moved, whatever it was. The advisor was still nervous about talking to the client and not being able to convey the issues and why they needed them. So, and again, not to promote vanilla, but one of the things that we developed shortly thereafter was the ability to just upload someone's statements and on, on the vanilla end, they'll get a review, they'll get a diagram and they'll identify the opportunities to improve the documents. And so I think from an advisor standpoint, whether you do it internally, whether you have an external resource that's helping you, whether it's an attorney or software, whatever it is, to understand someone's estate plan and identify areas where they can improve, I think it's incumbent upon advisors to do that work, make sure they're aware and make sure that stuff stays updated because I think the clients expect it. Uh, and unfortunately, many are not doing it. And 
certainly peace of mind for, for those those clients who know that their advisors have their best interests in mind and are taken care of and have those documents are asking the right questions can go a long way to drive you know your alpha all, all your you know your clients you know trust in, in, in what what's going to be most beneficial for them in the future and and their families like you said so definitely appreciate that and you know can certainly appreciate the value in a software like like vanilla to help with that and to really make it just a little less intimidating for those advisors day to day when, when they're looking to really provide that value, but ultimately knowing what next steps to take to make sure that that's all there during the presentations, you know, day after day, year after year. Yeah, the, the client doesn't expect the advisor to be the expert just to help identify areas where they may need an expert. And so I, I that's what I'm encouraging advisors to do. Just take it up a notch. Ask if they have stuff first, review it and possibly identify they need to talk to an expert. You don't have to be a trust in the state attorney as an advisor. And one other thing I forgot to mention, every client that has kids that are above the age of 18, but are not yet effectively on their own, should have a HIPAA release and healthcare powers and financial powers. I didn't even think about it till we brought it up um, at Vanilla and we made that available. I have a kid who plays college sports, didn't even think that if he got hurt and we hadn't signed a release, there's a chance I couldn't get information from the hospital because I didn't have a HIPAA release signed because he's over 18 or I couldn't get access to make healthcare decisions for him. So that's another place advisors can do something very, very simple for their clients that have adult children, um, but that are not independent, don't have their own plans, making sure they've got those things in place. Absolutely. And, you know, ultimately that's, you know, just again, taking that next step to, to provide that additional value. It's, it's huge and, and can really offer that peace of mind you're talking about. And, you know, right now, obviously there's lots going on, you know, lots of headlines out there talking about potential, you know, changes, you know, in the future, but also, you know, discussions around what could be impacting estates. And so this potentially could be a great opportunity in a moment in time to be able to, to start those conversations and dialogues with, with, with the clients and, and really provide that additional value. So, I think that's fantastic. Now, when we're talking about ultimately these potential changes we see, you know, in the future, you know, ultimately we've we talked through, you know, what things maybe we should be looking out for, who who might be impacted most, you know, by those potential shifts and, and changes. But really, what strategies, you know, uh, again, you know, can we can we really implement to, as you said, you know, maybe not jump the gun on on the, you know, harvesting gains, but uh, you know potentially adapt to to make sure our clients know that individuals are taking the appropriate steps in the right direction to, to take care of their needs. So uh, on the income tax side, I think it's having the discussion about what might happen and why you are or are not making a decision to act. And so the, the only real topics that we have to deal with there are potential increase in capital gains and potential increase in income taxes. Uh, and so I think proactivity is, is essential. Um, and I think you're never going to make the right decision because we don't know what's going to happen, um, but you're going to make the best guess and work with the client. And I think that's going to instill confidence on the estate planning side, where the potential for changes is for folks who are above the exemption limit or may be above the exemption limit, let's say in, in 2026, if not earlier. And there it's getting them to move assets out of their estate. And what I often tell people is if you do your planning right, if your trusts are flexible enough, but still qualify for a completed gift, then three things will be true. One will be you can kind of control everything because you can be the investment manager. Um, you still need an independent trustee. Um, two, won't change your cash flow. There are lots of different ways to access funds that you've moved out of your estate. Um, and three, if you don't like it, you can undo it. So if you use something like slats, where spouses are potential beneficiaries of each other's trusts, then the trustee could always distribute all the assets back out to the spouse, in which case you can undo your planning. You would have wasted your exemption, but you still have the eject button. Uh, we don't, I've never seen anyone use it, but it's available to them. And then the trust can lend them money, uh, trust can buy assets from them or for them. So lots of different flexibility. Um, and so people who are otherwise afraid of doing planning shouldn't be. And then what advisors can do is become more familiar with things like spousal lifetime access trust slats, GRATs, which are kind of heads you win, tails you tie, 
um, or other things that can move assets out of a client's estate. And again, just have the conversation with the client so you've done your job advising them. And if they opt not to do something, then at least you've advised them on what they could do. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. It's it truly, you know, not reinventing the wheel here, but just making sure that the conversations are had and making sure that, you know, they're aware of, of the options that are available to them. So yep. with all this in mind, you know, keeping, you know, all, all this information on helping the clients, making sure that they're, you know, prepared for potential changes to come. How do you see this fitting into an advisor's and, or a firm's, you know, growth for the future or the ability to, to, to gain new business? And, and is there op more opportunity, you know, that's, that's untapped at the, at the moment in your opinion? Yeah, so let's talk about the, the history of our business. I'm, I'm a little older than you are, but when I started in 89, you used to be you go to a broker at a wirehouse for the most part, and they'd say, well, how old are you, Daniel? Oh, you're 35? Well, you should have 65% of your money in bonds and 35% U.S. stocks, and I'm going to manage those U.S. stocks for you. Over time, it's moved to asset allocation and global diversification. Um, and then we've also seen a big growth in passive versus active. And so what has happened is a lot of the services that advisors provide have become commoditized and automated. Um, I still think there's a lot of hanger honors to the past, uh, advisors that believe I can still find a better asset allocation or I can get you into better funds than you can get in yourself or worse yet, they don't believe that, but they are still saying to themselves, <clears throat> this is what I sold to clients for the last 20 years. So I can't move them away from that, <clears throat> excuse me. Today, I think it's become table stakes to provide uh, financial planning and provide asset allocation, provide fund selection. Uh, that is gonna be a staple for everybody if they're not already providing that. So what are the differences? Well, that's where estate planning, I think is kind of the next frontier where an advisor can do something that maybe their competitor isn't doing or to add value because with the robo-advisors automating a lot of what can happen, they've effectively benchmarked the prices. So if somebody can go to a Betterment or a Wealthfront or a Schwab or Fidelity and basically get something for zero to 25 or 30 basis points, they may ask the client, well, why am I, the advisor, why am I paying you something much greater than that, two to three times that amount? And the answer should be more than just, you like me? because I provide the financial planning, because I am helping you with the state plan, and because I'm here to answer your questions and explain things in a way that makes sense. Um, and so these are areas that I think advisors should be focusing on so they can make a difference in their relationship with their clients. Fantastic. And, you know, I just actually want to address, you know, uh, one quick thing that uh, did come up and just to circle back uh, from, from an actual question that came into the uh, webinar here. Uh, if we can just, for just a moment, just circle back to this question, which came from Dan. He asked us, you know, what are some of the reasons why a person or family would need to update their will or trust when they're actually moving to different states? And so, you know, could we just provide a little context around that for, for our advisors who are in attendance today? Yep. Uh, different states have different rules. They have different rules about probate. Some have estate taxes actually in that state. And so how it's set up for that state. Some are community property states. Some are not community property states. Um, so all those are nuanced. It doesn't mean that if you move and you go to another state, you can't apply some of uh, your documents. They just may not be appropriate. So New York just updated, as an example, some of their healthcare powers and making sure that you stay updated. Um, those are all reasons to just minimize the friction that somebody who has to deal with your estate is faced with when you die. So on top of grief, People who have to settle estates are dealing with a nightmare they've never had to deal with before. It's a bureaucracy of biblical proportion, and it's something they deal with once or twice in their life. So it's just terrible. How do you minimize that friction? Make sure your documents are current. Make sure everything's organized. Um, another place advisors can really help, look inside your book and make sure your client's accounts are registered in the name of their revocable trust. Even though a pour over will, will say, hey, anything I forgot to put into my revocable trust, put into my revocable trust. Um, it doesn't always work that way. And if you didn't do any of it, you still have to go through the paperwork nightmare. It is very, very easy to move accounts 
into the name of, the, of a client's revocable trust, and I would strongly encourage advisors to do it. And while it sounds like an administrative nightmare, it isn't, and more importantly, it shows the client you're proactive, you're doing something for your paycheck, um, you're making their life easier, and you're looking out for their well-being and their family's well-being. So it's an easy, easy action. It doesn't take any knowledge. Fantastic. And so, as you mentioned, you know, Vanilla would be a platform that, you know, advisors can can upload those documents to and have that kind of, you know, overview and, and those those insights, you know, provided. And and ultimately, in your mind, you know, what additional types of value can, can a software like Vanilla provide, you know, as it, as it relates to those types of documents? Well, there's a bunch of aspects to the software, but if we just focus on that, um, I, I see the workflow looking something like this. I meet you, you're a new client, or you're an old client and I never asked you for your documents, but I ask you for your documents. Let's say I know nothing about estate planning. I can log in, set you up as a client, answer a few questions on the onboarding process, like what state does the client live in? Um, what's their net worth? What are their family members' ages? And a bunch of other questions that in two minutes or less of answering questions, it's gonna identify a bunch of opportunities like that client that moved from New York to Pennsylvania. Hey, they say they live in Pennsylvania, their documents say they're in New York, so here's something to fix. Um, they upload the documents and they get back and you can see a sample report on the justvanilla.com website, but they get back a report that shows what the family architecture is, what the trust architecture is, um, how the documents work, who gets what and when, and identifies um, some basic outcomes financially, depending on their estimated net worth. Um, but the last couple of pages will identify opportunities. Here's a problem that we saw in the documents you need to fix. So as I said, it gives advisors the opportunity to have that discussion and be proactive. If you take it to the next level in the ultra offering, you can actually connect to Adapar, Black Diamond, um, Orion, uh, the ultra solution and actually have all the data in there and start identifying what's in their state, what's out of their state, what kind of trust it's in, what's in an LLC versus not an LLC, who are the owners of the LLC, and really get a very detailed output of what someone's estate looks like. And so for someone who has a taxable estate, that's really valuable. And from all that data that we will mine, we will proactively tell an advisor here's something that we noticed that you can do to help your client. So what we're trying to really do with the client is say, Daniel's portfolio has a high volatility asset in it and he's above the exemption limit. He may want to do a GRAT. Here's how a GRAT works. And that's a simple example. Or we looked through Daniel's accounts and noticed that most of them are still in his name and are not in the revocable trust. We recommend you do this. Or the house is still in Daniel's name. Here's a, we have a, a connection with US deeds to transfer the house into the right um, uh, ownership structure. So those are some of the things that does a lot more, but those are things that I think an advisor can take advantage of immediately. Fantastic. And ultimately, as you said, you know, if you have a family, if you have kids, you know, if there's if there's an opportunity to, you know, plan better for, for the people around you, you know, estate planning can be an invaluable tool. And, and ultimately, I know I've talked to a lot of advisors who are very excited about vanilla as well. And, you know, certainly a tool like Right Capital can help you with some of those some of those checklists and having some of those basics down and, and understanding how to map that out in a plan. But, you know, having that next level of information is, is very helpful and, and provides a lot of peace of mind as we said but steve that is it for our questions today we genuinely appreciate all the time you've spent with us and, and the time out of your day and you know if anything else you want to close on we can uh have you a quick final thought here just we're, we're right capital users we love it these software work really well together to complement one another vanilla is not meant to be in the financial planning space um so i think those tools can really become a, an important arsenal for advisors. But I encourage everyone to ask the hard questions, get out of your comfort zone, make sure you're doing a great job for your client, differentiate yourself from the advisors that are not. Um, and I appreciate you having me on today. Of course, it's our pleasure. And thank all of you for attending. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy the holiday weekend. We'll see you next time.